this. All right. So today is uh, our last, probably our last. There might be a few slides of material left over, um, but this should be our last day of new material. If we don't get to any of the material at the end, it's mostly stuff that um, that you can you can read the slides and and um, just get basically get some vocab. So for next week, you have the option to take the test either on Tuesday or Thursday. Or will there be a review lecture going on on Tuesday, or will you just be here like parking? So so the, the plan is we're going to use the lab times as office hours review session. Okay. Um, I'm I'll look at getting a classroom rather than being in the lab because that lab's not a super great place to hang out and study. Um, but yeah, the review session will be. Um, Monday and Tuesday during the lab time slots. Um, you can come yeah. either or both if you have if you have the availability on Mondays. Um, I think on 1030, 1030 to we won't say 1030 to 130 because I have to make it over to the high school um, in the afternoons on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So we'll, we'll say like 1030 to 1230 review session on Monday. Um, and then your normal lab time slot, and that is the night to do Tuesday. And then you can choose, you don't have to tell me ahead of time. Um, if you have any accommodations with FAS um, for testing, make sure you schedule that appointment. So, and then they'll be, that copies me on an email sign so note and make sure that there's a copy waiting for you when you get there. Um, otherwise, Either come Tuesday or come Thursday, I'll probably change up some numbers and things like that. But you know, honor system for the most part between Tuesday and Thursday. Don't talk to anybody who took the test on Tuesday if you're taking the test on Thursday. I know that location is always there. Um, so I will change up the problems a little bit between the two, um, but they should be for the most part the same difficulty level. And it, I don't think there's really a whole lot of surprises that you could have. On my tests, right? Because it's ten parts. You know exactly what the ten things are. Um, the one thing that would be easy to tell somebody where to get an advantage would be the, you know, the definitions, basically. Um, and so I'll change up all the definitions and, uh, at the end. But for the most part, you already know what it's going to be, right? So there shouldn't be any surprises or any need to to talk to anybody about it. Um, Are you uh, posting a key for the practice exam? I will post a key. I have it saved. I'll post it this afternoon. Okay. Um, and then no quiz this weekend. So two weeks off in a row. Lucky you. Um, so just work on the practice test so that you can come in on Monday and Tuesday next week and ask questions, get clarification, do practice problems, that kind of thing. Um, and then the other nice thing about get, getting through this chapter is that we sort of get into like a weird grab bag of special topics stuff after this. We kinetics and nuclear reactions is the last big picture like you need to get through this chapter if you're teaching gen chem. The other chapters we're going to get through, we're going to do some intro to OCHEM, intro to biochem. Um, we'll do a little bit of material science, um, talk about like carbon nanotubes and stuff like that. Um, and do a little bit of geology type stuff. Um, although I've never taken a geology class, so I don't know that much about the geology. Um, but basically it's just more complicated crystal structures, but it's not, they're all too complicated to really like do things like lattice structures or things like that, like you did when you first did solids. Um, so it's gonna be a lot of, the, the last half of this class is gonna be a lot of sort of vocab type stuff, general concepts, not a whole lot of math moving forward after this test, um, which is probably feels kind of nice at this point, especially when you're studying for this test, right? Um, so just so everybody's aware where we're headed after this, it's kind of, I won't call it a victory lap, but it's like we're getting, we're done with the stuff we needed to get through now that we get through once we're done with the which feels good, right? You've been putting in all this work for the last six months, seven months um, in this class, in this series. So you're approaching the finish line. All right. Um, I think we got through all the relevant quiz questions and most of the random ones too. 
but I'll take it. I'll pause for a second. Does anybody have any questions specifically um, about nuclear nuclear reactions or anything that we've been going over? that you want to throw out there, or just feel free to, as usual, to ask while we're in the process, Lucas? Yeah. So, uh, what are your little bit of gravitation on positron uh, decay? Yeah. So that's many a essentially a positive electron, but it's not. It's not a proton, right? It's not a proton. It's, it's, it's at the mass of an electron, but the charge of a proton. Does that mean that you use that one of the uh, neutrons becomes an electron bound on the charge? Or? The other way around. One of one of the protons becomes a neutron. Okay. So it's, you can think of the positron as as the positive charge piece of a proton. Okay. If you take the charge away from the proton, what you're left with is just a neutron. Okay. And again, that's not the actual process, but it's a good way to think about it. If you lose the positive charge, you still have just as much mass. You just that just means you turn a proton into a neutron. Um, doesn't the charge become negative on the overall atom then? Uh, yes, but in terms of how many electrons are around the outside, but when we're dealing with these nuclear reactions, we kind of are ignoring the electrons around the we're just looking at the nuclei. Right. Because if you if the charge changes like that, then yeah, there's some other chemical reaction that'll wind up happening as well. Uh, but we're not worried about that at this point. Yeah. Is, are the masses of the um, the like on the stuff that you do on that? Yes, just like on the on the practice test. Um, and you can even take into account things like. Um, like antimatter reactions, things like that, yeah, where you have a positron running into an electron, they both disappear and turn into pure energy. The amount of energy you get is based on the mass of the positron and the mass of the electron, just the same way as E equals, still using E equals MC squared. Um, so they behave, all of these nuclear reactions or where you have a change in mass from reactants to products, they are all gonna follow those same rules too. And I'll give you those all those relevant masses. Okay, like this one. <clears throat> so it'll be in a format just like this, just like the practice test. Here's the pieces. Here's what they all weigh in AMU. How much energy is it? Tricky about this really? All products minus reactants, right? If it's not all one to one ratios, an interesting sum. Um, if it's not all one to one ratios, then you do have to take into account stoichiometry just like you would with the delta H value, but it's really just add up your reactants, add up your products, products minus reactants, gets your change in mass. Three. One. Three. One, one, three. Are you multiplying the AMUs or adding? Or adding. Adding. Adding the AMU. So our change in mass for this fusion reaction is pretty small. 0.0912. So 
then what do we need to do in order to, to get that in real energy units? Multiply by C squared, what does our mass have to be units wise? Kilograms. And technically, grams times meters squared over seconds squared is also an energy unit. Um, it's just not a common one. But technically, any mass times any speed squared units will give you um, will give you an energy unit. It's just not a standard energy unit. The change in mass and means should be in Same number though. No, it's uh, uh, like, yeah. What? That does seem this is about 0.02, so that does seem one one eight. One eight eight. Want that in kilograms, so we're going to divide by a thousand, so that's going to make it 1.1, 1 1.88. 1, 1 negative 10 to the negative fifth kilograms times c squared, which is 3 times 10 to the eighth. So 9 times 10 to the 16, once you square it. Is there, how do you know it's c squared? How do you know what C squared is? Because it's the speed of light. So it's constant. It's it, for to three sig figs, it's 3.00 times 10 to the 8. So if you square that, you get 9 times 10 to the 16. I just didn't write them. Like one point seven eight ish. Yeah, one point seven times the twelve or negative one point seven. That's in joules per mole. So the same ballpark really as as our uranium reaction. Um, I don't know if you remember the number we were looking at, but I, it might have been times 10 to the 13. It was about 10 to the 10 kilojoules per mole, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, one of the advantages of fusion is that our reactants are so small. Instead of dealing with a giant uranium, where our, we have about, about a factor of a hundred difference in the mass of our reactants. So we still, we wind up with similar numbers for kilojoules per gram of fuel because our reactants are so much smaller, um, which is interesting. It's one of the reasons why fusion, getting fusion reactors to work, we'll talk about energy in more, more specifically, like generating electricity. Um, fusion reactors working would be a huge, made a huge difference um, because one, we can generate this fuel pretty easily. Deuterium, hydrogen two, is already found naturally on in uh, water and breathe about, I think it's one out of every thousand hydrogen atoms is, is deuterium. And then if you take a deuterium and you use a particle accelerator to throw a neutron at it, you get uh, hydrogen three, which is also called tritium. Try it for three. Um, and so in theory, if we can get fusion reactors to work anywhere we find water, we'd be able to generate pretty much limitless energy um, in terms of electricity with very little in the way of toxic byproducts. There'd be some, some amount of toxic byproducts from the enrichment process, 
Um, but in general, it's really a very clean process. Of course, we don't know what um, what would happen what would happen to the process if engineers and capitalism got their hands on it and you know farmed out all the externalities like they do for, for oil production. Um, but in theory, it should be a much more a much cleaner process. Uh, and so it's sort of the holy grail. If we got fusion reactors to work, basically we don't need renewables anymore. It would make it would make electricity so cheap and so plentiful. Um, we're talking like less than pennies on the dollar compared to solar, um, without the need for producing batteries for produce, um, and all the pollution that comes along with that, or um, changing anything about the landscape. Really, we wouldn't even have to put up wind farms uh, if we could get fusion to work. Um, so that would be a really, really big deal, which is one of the reasons why it's been sort of a leading research topic for the last. Oh, I don't know. So probably since like the 1950s. Um, because it has, and the ability to then take a fusion reactor and just and travel with it, a fusion reactor in theory is would be about as big as this room, maybe. The current plans that I've seen. I, there have been some talk of even smaller ones but they've never been able to make it work sustainably um, with the uh, with smaller ones or really with even with the big ones. But if you can think about like putting a room this size on a spaceship that where all you need is water to be able to generate limitless electricity wherever that spaceship went, it would make colonizing planets like Mars um, or even you know more distant moons uh, a lot more feasible because you wouldn't have to do like supply drops to set things up. You just land, you've already got your fusion reactor, which, which is big enough to power a large city. Um, and you just have that built in to the, the structure of the ship already. So it would be, and that's why pretty much all realistic sci-fi, what they call hard sci-fi, is almost all of it is based around the idea of we're probably going to get this to work at some point. So let's just skip to that point and see what happens and what you know projections might look like. Um, but pretty much all has anybody watched the expanse or read the expanse books? There's um a really good show on I think it was on sci-fi first, and then it was a prime original. Um, they did a really good job looking at like what would humanity expanding throughout our solar system look like. Did I see a question over there, Orlin? Um related, but you had mentioned about like sending people to space and the solar, yes. solar radiation being too much. So were you saying that solar radiation, is that somehow a nuclear energy or is it in, just that it's- In the, the sense that the sun is a giant fusion reactor. It, yeah. Yes. Um, it's a byproduct of, of the sun's ongoing fusion. Um, and if we did send like even the moon is mostly within the Earth's magnetic field, and a lot of the higher energy radiation from the sun gets diverted around the moon. Mm -hmm. So we haven't really had to worry about it. If we colonize the moon long term, then we would have to have more radiation shielding. Uh, but and there's a lot of, of really good scientists and authors have have spent a, a lot of time. What well, what would it look like if you had to spend months on a spaceship in between planets? Or spend time on a planet with no, um, with no magnetic field, and basically, for the most part, you're going to take a ton of radiation, not to fatal levels. And again, that's we'll talk about absorbed radiation and what that looks like too. Um, but you would also be able to mitigate it by doing mm -hmm. things like putting water around the ship, where the part of the ship where you live, because water absorbs radiation pretty well, or gener using electromagnets. Um, that run the length of the entire ship to generate your own magnetic field around the whole ship as it's traveling. So there are ways to mitigate it, but it is definitely a, a wrinkle that you have to pay attention to if you're set, if people are actually traveling for an extended period of time in space, um, especially if they're not willing to totally, you know, if you don't want them to just come out the other end with a hundred times greater risk of cancer. Um, 
which I think everybody would prefer to not have that. All right, another practice problem. Let's, let's involve time again. So first order reaction, because all of our nuclear reactions are first order reactions. Plutonium-236 is an alpha emitter with a half-life of 2.86 years. If a sample initially contains 1.35 milligrams plutonium-236, what mass of plutonium-236 is present after five years? So we just need to find K based on the half-life that we're given. And then we have enough, once we have K, we're just going to plug K in, plug in five for T. And we have an initial mass. Three, five milligrams. We're solving for that. We got to start by finding K. Because it's the half life, we're taking the natural log of 0.5, the natural log of half. This is just another way. This is just done the algebra moving the minus k over, right? It's the same reactor, same equation we've used before. Which we can rearrange that way to get a value for k. So we'll get 0 0.619 over 2.86 years. Equals K. 0 0.242. The, the units on, on rate constants, again, don't always make a whole lot of sense, but they're worth paying attention to just so you know what time units you need, right? If we get like something from the clock reaction lab where you, your units on the rate constant are one over molarity cubed times seconds, one over molarity cubed part doesn't mean a whole lot. But the fact that it's in seconds tells you that if you're using these equations, any time you use needs to be in seconds as well. So the fact that our half-life is in years means our K value is going to be one over years, which means when we plug it in, we're going to plug in our time in years here. Just as long as you're consistent, that should all take care of itself. If it asks what's what mass of plutonium-236 is present after 30 days, we would just have to do the conversion to convert days to years before we plug it in. So then now we're going to plug in everything here. That we're solving for. We've got 1.35 milligrams here equals K times T, negative K times T. Just ballpark. If we've got 2.86 years to the half life, five years is between is just under two half lives, right? So we should wind up, if we do that right, we should wind up with a little bit, a little bit more than a quarter of what we started with. So something in so half of this would be about 0.7. And then half of that would be 0.35. So we should wind up with something around the 0.4 milligrams range if we do our math right. Just to do our reasonableness check. Mm -hmm. 
So five times point two four two is going to be one point two one. Negative. Negative one point two one equals ln of a over one point three five. So raise both sides to the power of e, or e to the power of both sides, rather. Our final amount a is going to be zero point four three. Oh, Sorry, I say zero point. Four point zero three. Thank you. Again, we we're pretty close with our ballpark mental arithmetic, right? So, if if anything, nuclear reactions make the kinetics easier because you're not worried about what's zero order, what's second order, all the other integrated rate laws. Everything is first first order integrated rate law. Any questions on this one? Jackson? Where does the half point equation come from? The same equation. It's the same equation, except oh, you plug in 0. 0.5 of A naught up here. The A naughts cancel out, right? Yeah. Are we just uh, generalizing? Like, are all, are all radioactive reactions actually first order? Or? All naturally occurring. Oh. Um, so technically fusion would be would be second order because you need your two pieces to run into each other. So fusion reactions are going to be first order in each of the pieces. And same we'll see for the true fission reactions, like the fission reactions that you that you use to make nuclear weapons rely on an, on a neutron running into an unsta already unstable nucleus. And so those would technically be second order as well. But all the naturally occurring processes are first order. So let's do another one. This one's another naturally occurring one. So this is the way we look at using uranium-238 and its half-life to date things. It's not usually just how much uranium-238 there is. Because if you think back to the carbon dating, the carbon dating, we had to start from a set amount we, where we knew how much carbon-14 was in the sample to begin with in order for it to work, right? Well, if something is, if we don't know where that material came from to begin with, we don't know that it came from a textile or from a plant or something like that originally, that gets a little trickier. So we kind of, we rely on geologists to some extent to be able to, to tell us, okay, this is an ore that has a mixture of lead 206 and uranium 238. And we know that the half-life for the process of uranium-238 turning into lead-206 um, has a half-life of 4.5 billion years. So instead of just looking at the raw amount of uranium-238, we're looking at how much the uranium-238 has converted to its final product. So for, if it says 0.556 grams of lead 206 for every one gram of uranium 238. That means that if we assume that all of the lead 206 started as uranium 238, about a third of it has decayed. Right? Because if we started with 1.556 grams of uranium 238, And then we're reaching a point where there's 0.556 grams of lead 206. So we can say that the starting amount of uranium 238 was 1.556 grams. 
And of that, one gram of it is left. That still gives us enough that if we know the K value, we can predict, um, we can predict how much time has elapsed. So this is actually the sort of, this is the way that they've dated the solar system in addition to being able to observe the solar life cycle um, and know roughly how old the sun is, we can date the formation of the planets by looking at a lot of these, these uranium heavy rocks and look at the ratio of uranium 238 to lead 206. And there's a few others that have similar half-lives um, that, that are present in other rock samples. Um, potassium is one of them. There's a, a way to use potassium to date um, to date the, the how old that rock sample is. Uh, and so we can date the age of the planets um, based on using this type of logic. All right, so let's figure out how old this meteorite is. If it started entirely as uranium-238, Our A naught, I mean, this is a ratio, right? But it doesn't really matter that it's a ratio because it's that ratio is like a concentration, right? So we can say our A naught is 1.556 grams. And our A is 1.00 grams. So we'll do the same thing from the half-life to get K value. Uh, a lot of times when we're dealing with astronomical times, you'll see BY, billion years. Actually, a lot of times it'll be, um, if you're in history terms, they'll say Billion years ago, BYA or MYA. Um, in this case, we're, I'm just going to abbreviate that so I'm not using scientific notation since I ran myself out of room here. So we'll get what is that? Well, I'm blanking on that. 6.6. It's not 619, is it? 0.693. For whatever reason, I got my old area code stuck in my head. 619 is San Diego's area code. And once I thought of that, I could not come up with 693. If you wanted to do it in scientific notation instead of using billion years, it would just be e to the nine, right? Not e to the nine, but e nine times ten to the nine. So we should get a really small number, right? Something times ten to the minus ten. I'm not a I don't know you want to talk. Minus 20 doesn't make sense. Uh, 1.54. I got 1.54. I got negative 1.54. So, so minus the negative, negative. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I got that too. Doesn't like my rates, obviously, but it's as usual. So that should be years to the minus one. Is it okay to put billion years, or is that if you did a billion years, it, you should have point one five four billion yeah. years, right? Yeah, and that works too. Just know that your final time is going to be in billion years. 
Yeah, but you should get the same exact number just with that caveat. I agree, so we need that still. I guess with our rules for sig figs, when we added that together, it should be 1.56. Because we keep the uncertainty in the hundreds place if we add these two numbers together, right? So, natural log of 1.00 over 1.56. Equal to 1.54 e to the minus negative 1.54 e to the negative 10 times t. Now I can erase this in the first place. With these, if you plug in 1.556 versus 1.56, that's probably enough with it being in a log factor. That's not to throw it off by that much. That's still the same number within sig figs. So if you've ever wondered how we know the solar system is roughly 3 billion years old or the planets were formed roughly 3 billion years ago, this is how. When stuff stopped being just a giant cloud, we had all these elements sort of coagulate, condense into solid. We, we have a bunch of different evidence that says that most of those materials were formed at about the same time. And it's, they all agree that it's somewhere in the ballpark of 3 billion years ago. Um, and even, even on Earth, we can look at different uranium cores that, that we can tell from the geology all formed as one cohesive uranium core that now has a mixture of lead and uranium mixed into the crystal structure. We can tell based on the crystal structure that it didn't melt and reform or anything like that. And we can, it, we can use the same math to date that to say, okay, it's Earth formed or this rock still formed about 3 billion years ago. And when you do that from a bunch of different rocks and you do it with a bunch of different radioisotopes and you all get, you get close to the same answer for all of them, that's enough evidence to say we have a pretty decent idea of when Earth formed or what at least like, was more or less formed. It was kind of, it's an ongoing process, right, at that point. Um, but we can say that most of these rocks that made up the bulk of the Earth's crust were in place about 3 billion years ago. That was born half billion years ago. That's when the sun, um, the sun started, I believe. But maybe I'm off base on that. I thought, I thought that the solar system as a whole was about 4.5 bill, 4 billion years and that the earth was about 3 billion years, but I might be off on that. I didn't double check my cosmology before last day. <laughs> So this is 4.5 billion for all of the Earth. Okay, so then this is just a meteor that's formed some other process just for the sake of doing this problem. Um, the same the same point is made though, right? We can use this map that's pretty bulletproof um, to be able to say that we, we know for a pretty good, I mean, plus or minus 10%. There's a reason this is 4.5, not 4.5 up. Right, so we're still plus or minus 100 million years with those numbers. All right, any, any other questions on the radiometric dating side of things?
The trickiest thing usually is figuring out what your A naught is. And then, but other than that, if you're given a half-life, you just use the half-life to find K, plug in everything you know, and use that to find T. All right, let's, let's talk about nuclear chain reactions. So nuclear chain reactions happen when the product of, in chain reactions in general, the reason that they're called a chain reaction um, is they're sometimes called autocatalytic reactions. A chain reaction means that the product of the reaction, one of the products of the reaction, speeds up the reaction itself. So in this case, if we have a, a neutron bumps into uranium-235 and gets lodged into the nucleus and they get uranium-236 temporarily, it does, when it does that, it actually makes it so unstable, it'll split apart into larger pieces or smaller pieces, including three more neutrons. Each of those neutrons could bump into another uranium-235 nucleus and start the process again. So the product of the first step then goes on to have the first step happen again. So we get sort of an exponential growth because every time this happens, you get three more neutrons. And if those three neutrons all have caused it to happen again, the second time this reaction happens, now we've got nine neutrons. We have this process, and that's what's meant by the term autocatalytic or a chain reaction in general, is that once the process starts, it can keeps itself going. And usually a lot of those wind up having an uh, exponential growth factor. Um, there are some cases where you have a reaction where it's just a one-to-one -one and the reaction will keep itself going indefinitely, um, but it doesn't really speed up necessarily. Um, but in this case, we wind up with, with a three to one ratio. Um, and this is really the process. This is, this is the process that they call, um, well, actually, what is the term? Um, this is the process that they use to make nuclear weapons. If you can cause this to happen on a predictable way, and each of these steps generates those huge amounts of uh, um, energy that we've been calculating, then we basically just wind up with a whole bunch of energy being dumped into the surroundings all at once, which is not very healthy for the surroundings. Um, the trick is to do it in a controlled way. It's nice to be able to get all of that energy um, in the case of weapons, perhaps maybe nice is the wrong term. Um, it's convenient to be able to get all of that energy all at once, but you want it to happen in a way so that it doesn't happen, say, on its way to the destination or during the testing process before they're ready for it, right? So you don't want to generate something where it will spiral out of control until you're ready for it to spiral out of control. Um, and so that's the engineering part. So this is the science part for the Manhattan Project, was just figuring this out. How do we control or how do we um, generate reactions that'll go through this process really convenient in a really, really um, you know, quick way, but then trying to de design the device that'll allow us to control when it starts, when we can trigger it, was is the tricky part. And so really the Manhattan Project and the, the, whole, the whole process um, in Oppenheimer is really more of an engineering story than it is a science story. Because the engineers take science and then put it to practical use. The scientists were drafted as the engineers because they were the only ones in the, in the world that understood the science at that point. Um, but really, a bunch of engineers after World War II wound up actually greatly, I don't know if you would say improving the process, um, in increasing the yields. Um, once the engineers get their hands on it, you can usually rely on things to get optimized pretty well um, at the, you know, to the detriment of other things sometimes. Um, 
So the thing is, if you're below a certain amount, which they call the critical mass, then even though you're generating all those neutrons through this process happening, if more than more than half the neutrons are actually escaping from that core, then it actually doesn't, you don't get that chain reaction happening because you don't get that exponential growth unless on average at least are greater than one of those neutrons is being captured per on average, right? Otherwise, you just get the reaction happening at the same rate if it's one neutron being captured at a time. And so they call that critical mass. Once you get above critical mass, um, then you wind up with more neutrons being captured than escaping, and you start that runaway process. Um, and so the way that they controlled that, that they figured out how to control it, is they wound up making two pieces of uranium that were enriched to a certain level. And then they physically separate each of these pieces was um, was under the critical mass, but when you combined them, you got something that was more than critical mass. And so that meant that until we actually slide this on top of this other um, cylinder target, then it would, was not going to spontaneously go off. And, and so they just use when they call conventional explosive just like TNT, something. Um, and when that detonated, it would fire this piece of uranium at the smaller piece of uranium. When they combine, you get something that's above critical mass and the whole thing explodes. Um, and so they called this the, the little boy bomb. They were really pretty sure that this engineering style would work. Um, and this was, Obviously, big enough. This is the one that I was talking about the other day. That was about fifteen kilotons, um, and this was, you know, pretty fifteen kilotons already the largest bomb that had ever been detonated. That was less than the total amount of ordnance that had been dropped on Dresden and some of the German cities um, during World War II, but not by a whole lot. And that's talking about over four years of air raids dropped enough bombs to be about about the same as one bomb um, using this design. Um, the, when the scientists got together and started talking about ideas for how other ways that this design could be, or the yield could be increased, um, they came up with a, a design they called the Fat Man, which was basically they could get away with using less than critical mass if they if they detonated all these explosives in a sphere shape around this and basically slam all these chunks of plutonium together even harder. You could get that dense. The density would wind up being increased because you're applying pressure, immense pressure from all this conventional explosive on the outside. And that would make it actually even more dense than normal. So they were able to actually get the fission reaction, the chain reaction to begin um, with even underneath the critical mass. So only 41% of the critical mass for that isotope, but it could only be done with less stable material. So they had to make this one with plutonium instead of making it with uranium. Uranium is naturally occurring. Um, in the Earth's crust, and so you can just mine it. And all things considered, it's actually pretty un uniformly distributed around the Earth's crust. So you can really mine uranium just about anywhere you want. Um, but to make plutonium, you have to start from uranium and then enrich it by slamming alpha particles into it and get it to turn from being uranium to plutonium. I think alpha, I think it's two. Neptunium, I think, is between uranium and plutonium. Um, and so when you enrich it by, con by converting it to plutonium, you make it less stable. And then that also makes it so that you can use this design where you can use less total mass and still get a greater yield. So this one was 21 kilotons, so even bigger, but for less material. Lucas? No, well, it's something like weapons grade. It's something that's like heavily enriched. Compared to exactly. Enriched. And so weapons grade or enriched of any of these is generally, generally means that you Really, what they do um, for uranium in particular is uranium naturally occurs as a mixture of uranium 238 and uranium 235. 
Geranium 238 will not go through this process. Did I say that backwards? Why much larger be less stable? Um, uranium-235 will go through this. Uranium-238 will not go through it as easily. So what you do to enrich it is you literally put it into a giant centrifuge. A centrifuge that generates so much gravitational, not gravitational force, but so much force on the sample that you can actually separate out different isotopes from each other, even as a solid. The more dense material settles to the bottom. Um, and so then when you take the chunks, the chunk that's left on top, it's mostly uranium-235, and the chunk on bottom is mostly uranium-238. And that's what the enrichment process is. To make it weapons grade, you have to enrich it to a certain level. Um, and the difference between um, materials that you could use for a power plant and materials you could use for a bomb is like, requires machinery that's like an order of magnitude larger. So when they say like when you know if you've heard heard of weapons inspectors going into these um, these enrichment facilities to see if they're making weapons grade materials versus just power plant grade materials, um, it's really obvious to the inspectors because you need just a huge amount of infrastructure and machinery to get it all the way to weapons grade. Um, versus it still takes a lot of machinery and infrastructure to get it to to power plant grade. But not nearly as much. It's and it's so it's really obvious to, to anybody who's had the training, um, which is why uh, countries that are working or groups that are working to make weapons grade stuff, they just don't put the inspectors in. Um, you know, North Korea did that for a long time, right? UN and weapons inspectors were supposed to go in and make sure they're not making weapons grades. We're not making weapons grades. You just can't look at it. Um, which, if you've ever dealt with a toddler. Mm -hmm. um, is you know, say, I'm not doing anything wrong, but don't come in. You know absolutely that they're doing something wrong, right? Um, without getting into the geopolitics too much uh, of any specific um, individuals, <clears throat> Kim, um, that's about the level of, of discourse that's happening there. Um, so these were still pretty scary, the fact that they could make these, and one of them, they're, there's a lot of debate about the history or the history and what was happening um, to whether it was justified for the U.S. to drop these. And, it, and it's it's a really complicated topic. I don't think that there's a simple yes or no. Um, whether it was, I obviously don't think it was a good thing that we blew up two cities, um, but there were a lot of other pressures on the U.S. at the time that had nothing to do with Japan. Japan just wound up being the um, you know, the unfortunate recipient of, of these uh, as a way of the U.S. was just trying to stop things as fast as possible to limit how much territory Russia was taking back in Europe and over east into China. Um, and so as a result, there was a time crunch. And so the U.S. wound up using these when they probably didn't need to. Um, but that was really the start of the Cold War was actually while World War II was still going on. Russia and the U.S. were sort of jockeying for position for who was going to be the most important country after World War II. And this was how the U.S. sort of stopped that process, put everything, made it a Cold War rather than a, um, a, an actual war at the time. And that process continued because as soon as the U.S. made these weapons, it's not particularly tricky to engineer, right? If you have the access to the um, weapons grade materials, making these is not very hard. Uh, and so it didn't take very long before the USSR was making these as well. And that's what turned into the arms race part of the Cold War was how do we, well, how do we make ours better than theirs so that we can demonstrate that we are the ones that would win because it was really, you know, fell into that mutually assured destruction um, policy, whereas we're just gonna make it so that if, if Russia launched, when USSR launches weapons at us, they're gonna die too. And so it's basically like, you know, a suicide pact. You don't, if you don't do something or do something I don't like, then you're gonna die and I'm gonna die, but we'll both die together, which is a weird state to be in for 
I don't know, arguably we still kind of are. I think that's what I was gonna say. I feel like it's just like we're all holding on we're to still waiting on Putin to hopefully not decide that he's a nihilist and just wants to see everything go on his way out. Um anyway, so it's not we're not fully out of the specter of nuclear apocalypse, but we're mostly out of that that worry. It's not nearly as bad as it was um, until 1991. Um one of the next step in that was actually to make use of the fact that fusion could actually cause more energy to be released faster. The problem is you couldn't get these fusion reactions to happen unless you were really, really high temperatures. And so, so thermonuclear bombs or hydrogen bombs basically used conventional nuclear weapons, used fission-based weapons to start the fusion process. So they still had uranium and, and plutonium built into them um, as a way to, that was going to sort of be the ignition process. So you use conventional um, explosives to start the plutonium-uranium fission reaction, which then kicked off a fusion reaction based on deuterium and I think it's lithium. Yeah, lithium-6. Um, and when you start the fusion reaction, that kicked up a whole nother level. So if you look back at the numbers, it was we're looking at 21 kilotons thermonuclear weapons. We're now looking at 15 megatons. So a thousand times greater than the bombs that we lost Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and so in they basically basically turned into an international, you know kissing match for lack of a better term where we well, we're going to detonate our bomb over here and just just watch how big our bomb is now oh you think that's big well we got an even bigger bomb and they just kept going back and forth doing weapons testing when they didn't really need to test anything at that point um just as a way to demonstrate how good their bombs were um and a lot of it had to do with edward teller this guy he's a piece of work um <laughs> He, so he designed this thermonuclear weapon and he kind of had this weird complex where he couldn't admit to himself that his device could be used for negative reasons. But so kind of like Alfred Nobel with the, with the Nobel Peace Prize, um, Nobel, Alfred Nobel made TNT, made dynamite, and then as a result felt really bad about it and then turned his life around and started donating all this money to charities and founding the Nobel Prize Foundation. Um, Edward Teller did the opposite. He just doubled down. He's like, no, no, no. Thermonuclear bombs are cool, guys. Don't worry about it. We can find uses for them. You want to know what the moon's made of? We're just going to launch a thermonuclear bomb at it. And we'll just look at the light that comes off of it. That's going to tell us some interesting stuff. Um, oh, we want to dig a new harbor in Juneau, Alaska. We'll just detonate a new thermonuclear bomb in the bay. And boom, we got a bigger bay. Um, that was literally his, his thought process. And he was one of the top advisors to the presidents. Um, he was at the, had like a cabinet level position um, after World War II. And he, so um, a, lot of the, a lot of the reason we had so many of these hydrogen bombs for so long were because of him whispering in the right people's ears. Um, so it's, and yeah, I don't think he had, he didn't have a redemption arc um, like Albert Nobel. He just kept getting worse and worse. <laughs> um, and if you want to know, this is kind of an, again, I'll avoid the term fun, is an interesting link. We start like looking up this stuff when we're going to get plugged in. <laughs> no, it's, it's public information. Um, this, I can't get this link to work. Oh, that's why. Um, this is just basically you can say, okay, pick a spot on a map, um, and then you can see what it would look like if you detonated these various bombs. <laughs> So, here are some cities that think the most deserving to be most So, we, we would actually, if one of these big bombs was detonated in San Francisco, we would feel it here. 
Feel it. Feel it. Uh, it, it, wouldn't just, it wouldn't destroy things. We wouldn't die here immediately. If one of these goes off in San Francisco, there's other things happening that are probably a bigger problem. Want to get out um, immediately though because of like radiation, right? Let's see. 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 Let's see.
because it's on the bottom of the yeah. ratio. We're trying to solve for A, we want to move to 1, 2, 3, 5 over, so we multiply both sides by it. Yeah, I play around with that nuclear bomb now, but yeah, that's not the which one is being reduced, which one's being oxidized. So right. Yeah. The flip if need be for the ox for the oxidized one. Mm -hmm. But there's another thing you're doing in the lecture where you're basically saying just from looking at these values, we could figure out what's gonna happen. Yes. So, so if we know if we know that the reaction that something is gonna happen, right. we don't know whether the reaction is gonna happen backward or forward. Um the way we can tell what's going to happen is by keeping the cell pop, cell potential positive. Right. As as positive as it can be, right? I mean between the two. It's yeah. It's going to there's only one option really, because if you have to flip one of them, then if you flip the wrong one, you get a negative number. If you flip the right one, you get a or, positive or just a smaller. No, not nah, you can't wind up doing that because if you look at like, uh, I can't remember any of the top of my head, so I'll just yeah. add up some numbers. Yeah. If, if we have zero positive 0 0.70 volts versus, these are both for the reduction, mm -hmm. versus negative or positive 0 0.15 volts. If I have to flip one of those, I can't, there's no way I can flip one and get a positive number. In, or both, either of them. One of them is going to give you a positive number, one will give you a negative number. You can't get both of them being positive. Some of the E reductions that I saw in the examples were the value was negative. So even if it's negative, so I can flip this one, and then when I add them, I get 0.85, right? Mm -hmm. If I flip this one, I'm going to get negative 0.85. Because I'm going to have yeah. negative 0.7 and negative 0.15. Okay. So because of the, the nature of, if I don't flip this one, I have to flip that one. You're getting the same number, but negative if you mm -hmm. flip the wrong one. But it will always be a positive and a negative. You can't get two positives just by the way the math works. I think that I'd be a problem I was concerned that I was thinking like, why would why would it why would nature or the reaction pick a higher energy state or a higher voltage by default when typically nature wants to find lower energy states so remember that voltage also is the difference between the two energy states right and so when you have the reaction happening you're moving electrons from the high energy state to the low energy state true so having the bigger difference in voltage um, or the, the larger voltage means that you've got more driving force because you've got a bigger yep. jump between the high energy state and the low energy state so then the next question is just the Gibbs free energy equation with Faraday and E and moles of um, electrons. So is it E equals negative NFB? No, delta G equals delta negative, e. negative NFB. Mm -hmm. So my question was coming from E re reduction to this, mm -hmm. is there a conversion to get this into joules or is voltage? This is the conversion. This is the conversion. So it's Faraday. So Faraday is does it. Okay. You don't need Faraday, to Faraday, the Faraday's constant is the charge in Coulombs on one mole of electrons. So and then if you take that and you multiply Coulombs times volts, you get energy. That's right. It is. <laughs> you know, I actually don't know. I don't know that much. I'm sure there is, yeah. just like Faraday. Yeah. Um, I know Faraday's first name was Michael Michel, maybe I'm in French. Um, yeah, but I don't know who this was. I don't know the physics side as well. Coulombs times volts gives you joules. 
And, and, then and that comes from that the, the power equation. Yeah. Somebody who's in yeah. physics right now. What's uh what are the what's the variable that you use for power for circuits is W? Oh, oh so I will go out like Oh, w equals I, which is current times volts. Yeah. So I times current times voltage gives you watts, which oh, is a power. I'm like, like looking at it. Watts and volts divided by the energy that we're going to be using to watts and volts. Watts and volts. Okay. So all of them are the same. And time is constant if you use rules. So yeah, we can call it the one thing you need anyway. There's so many right? Yeah, so I'll take a little time. Um, I used to use Excedrin, but I have a thing that I think it's bad. I'm not saying I'm getting any of those. Everything always comes back to the W. But and you want, but there will be study from lots of different angles simultaneously. So by the time everybody reaches a conclusion that it goes everything is just delta G, they all are going to hide all these things. And it still is helpful because electrical engineering cares about different things than than you know other than chemists care about. So they're just going to use naturally. You know, Gravitating toward it is in a way that they care about designing circuits. We don't care about designing circuits, we care about designing batteries. But as much as those are related, they're also going to use different things. That's what the boat is supposed to be. I think that can get the science So we're covered, but. It, it, it is. Here. But yeah. it necessarily, that doesn't make it into a textbook. Well, that's why we use the textbook that we do from oh, open yeah. because it presents, instead of Wait, giving you, English. like they knew about voltages and stuff like this before they knew about it. So we actually, hey, I, when I first learned it, I remember learning orbitals after we so learned about like, it. Like, I can't just like the last thing I and the second. Crunch my eyebrows as much because the ones are going to be so early because it does we make more sense to build up from the base. And that's so rather than that, but it's there's, there's still temporary like squares. And that's why we started with thermodynamics before we got to voltages too and equilibrium. We did thermodynamics yeah. first. And it's just hard to see that connection right away. But now it's working. Now we can really see everything is delta G. It's not spread. Right. And then that reaction is better. I think about it. It's really good. Yeah, it's, it is all right. And it right. go in that flow. And really, we're just sort of setting the table because people that are going to go into designing batteries or going into electrical engineering are going to take the most out of that chapter, out of this entire school around it. Uh, but people that aren't are going to probably never think about voltages again, and that works too, right? We're just trying to get everybody ready for which direction they're going, but everybody's going. There's so many different fields that all start from this class yeah, for sure. that we just have to present it all of these different ways at the same time. Although that was helpful, though. Okay, good. No problem. No, this stuff just makes you feel that way. That too. Yeah. That's too. Yeah, I've been often conscious for some of this. Um, what? Well, that's why. Uh, before I forget this, I want to pull up the practice exam so I don't forget to tell everybody about the. Okay. Good. 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 Please form an experiment. Not baby. Actually, my face. Uh, I fell off and hit my head so much. Yeah, exactly. That's that's a perfect answer to some. I just want to make sure I did that correctly. Yeah, if anything, we would need to slow the reaction down in order to get usable numbers, right? Okay. Again, that down. It's like I do have a feel. 
until like two days later, I was studying for an anatomy and like completely forgot everything. And then like I didn't really think about going upstairs. Like I wouldn't do it on that. Think about studying. This is bad. Yeah, that's, that's just all right. Yeah. I think most of the people like, that aren't in here already heard me say this, but I'm going to just for the recording. Um, the practice test does have a typo in it on the the half reactions. Um, this AS two O five to H three AS O four. You get this. It's the same oxidation state for arsenic in both states. Um, which I didn't mean to do. That means the arsenic is not being oxidized or reduced, which means you're not going to be able to use the half reaction method to balance this. So um, take that five in the diarsenic uh, pentoxide, take that five and turn it into a four. It's AS2O4, not AS2O5. No. Um, and that should allow you to use the half reaction method. <laughs> if you got hung up, yeah. the, I think yeah, everything else in here is pretty good. Um, it's at least good enough that you can solve the problems, but that one is not solvable unless you fix that. So double check that you that you did that. And then let's talk about nuclear reactors. Um, I really like talking about nuclear bombs followed by nuclear reactors because it really makes the point that there's no such thing as a good technology or a bad technology. Technology is just useful. What it's used for, the applications that it's used for, can be good or bad, can have really dramatic, drastic effects on people. Um, but that doesn't make the technology itself I guess it is dangerous. Um, it doesn't make the technology itself harmful. It's just how it's used that determines its worth to humanity, right? Um, and that's you see that with every single technology that humanity has ever come up with has both its beneficial side and its harmful side. Um, when the, when Humanity first figured out how to smelt iron ore to make iron implements. The very first two things that were created were a plow for planting better and swords. Um, so it's like it's two sides of the same thing. Does is, is that mean that we should not we should not use iron smelting because it might be used to make swords? No. It just means that every technology has both aspects to it. Exactly. Um, so with that in mind, um, talking about nuclear power plants, um, as the other one that, that uh, is really prevalent right now that we'll talk about more when we get to biochem is genetically modifying organisms. That's not inherently a bad thing. It's a dangerous technology, just like nuclear materials. It's definitely a case of humanity's grasp might, it's, our reach might exceed its grasp. Uh, if it's not done properly, same with AI. All of these things are need to be approached carefully, but could have really, really positive, beneficial effects for humanity as a whole, um, but could also be disastrous. We're now reached the level of power as a species where we very easily could destroy ourselves, the entire planet, lots of other things have huge impacts that we don't fully understand yet. So. Um, nuclear power plants basically work the same way as a nuclear bomb, except we don't want it to reach critical mass. Right? When it reaches critical mass, you get that runaway chain reaction happening and you wind up with, with a, an explosion. Um, a nuclear reactor wants these nuclear processes to happen, not once. So when you design this, you're trying to let these nuclear reactions happen in a controlled way. And like all power, everything up until the discovery of semiconductors, every single way of generating electricity is basically a, a turbine. 
Um, everything short of photovoltaics is basically just spin a magnet inside a coil of wire. And when you do that, it generates current. So um, the way that nuclear power plants work is basically boil water. Oil water generates steam. When you generate steam, you can use steam to spin a turbine. That turbine's attached to a magnet inside a coil of water, which generates current. It's the exact same way that it, that coal-fired power plant, new natural gas power plant, um, wind turbines all work the same way. Spin a magnet inside of a coil of wire. Um, and so it's it's really pretty straightforward. The only thing that's tricky about a nuclear power plant is the extra safety measures. So the extra safety measures are basically all designed so that nothing that ever comes in contact with the core or with the nuclear uh, radioactive material is ever is ever um, allowed to escape that facility. And so you, you have these heat exchangers that, they, that are here labeled as steam generators, or basically you have this core and you pump this hot fluid around the core then the, the hot, that hot fluid then goes into these steam generators, which are filled with water. The water boils, generates the steam, spins the turbine, and then that water is, is then released. But that water that being then released, um, usually through through either big stacks or is released into um, just into the surroundings. A lot of times, they, if these are built on the coastline, they just use seawater for this part because it's right there and it's pretty much a constant temperature um, for your water intake. Um, but none of that stuff ever actually comes into direct contact with anything that's uh, radioactive. And so in theory, they, they contain their radioactivity and all the, this hazardous material really, really well. Their only real pollution is just heat pollution. The water that you then release after it spins the turbine is a lot hotter than it started with. And if it's seawater and you just release it back into the sea, you then wind up with locally creating an area of the ocean that's a lot warmer than it normally would be, which could be nice for surfing, but it's really a bad thing for um, you know wildlife um, and the local ecology. But it is fairly localized; it's not very widespread. How, like with a nuclear power plant, how does things go like around, like like Chernobyl? That's what happened with Chernobyl, right? Is like nuclear. Fukushima was a better example because so Fukushima basically this this dome that they use to keep all of the radiation contained fractured as a result of the earthquake. And so now all of a sudden all of this hot water that was being used that was actually in contact with the radioactive material would then escape and started leaking out into the surroundings. So that was Fukushima was a very well designed power plant. It was really safe. It was just built on an active tectonic fault which is probably not a good idea. That was just more like, well, all of Japan is on a night. Well, there's not really a place in Japan you could build a nuclear reactor without having that issue. Um, and we do understand engineering for earthquakes a lot better now than we did when Fukushima was built, which I think was the 80s. Um, and so if they, when they fixed, when they went in and fixed it, it now should be able to withstand the same level of an earthquake. Chernobyl was a different thing. One, Chernobyl was actually not engineered to the level that actually would be been considered safe in the U.S. ever, um, let alone today. It was built back in the early 60s, late 50s, I think. Um, and it, it already was not as sophisticated. It kind of had the same basic thing, but it did not have nearly as many fail safes and as much protection. And then it actually was a failure at the bureaucratic level because the engineers, the, the administrators decided, okay, we're gonna run this test where we shut everything down, bring it back online, simulate a power loss. Um, and the engineers that actually knew what was going on, the people that actually ran the plant said, you can't do that. We're not ready for it. Give us time, we'll get ready for it. And they said, no, we're doing this test. We're gonna test it right now. And when they shot it back, when they shut it down, it didn't come back online the way it was supposed to. Um, which, and it, when it shut down, it didn't have the fail safes to put it into a full um, lockdown, basically, to stop all of the uh, electricity generation. You just wound up with the temperature rising exponentially 
um, inside and, and basically stuff started melting. Um, and so that was not actually, even the worst disaster, nuclear disaster in history um, was not actually a result of the technology. It was the result of the humans that were in charge of the technology. User error, exactly. Um, that said, I, I am a big advocate for nuclear power, but at the same time, it does have lots of drawbacks. Um, I guess the other, let's talk about the rest of the, the actual reactor itself now, um, before we get into that. Um, if you've ever heard the term fuel rods or control rods, basically what happens is these fuel rods are just long cylinders that are predominantly uranium. 235, not predominantly, only about 3%. Um, that, that's the radioactive isotope that's that's present. And when you if you just put all of these together, then you would actually be above critical mass and you could potentially have, I, if they're designed properly, you shouldn't be above critical mass, but it could be high enough that you could have a problem um, as far as how much, how many neutrons are being released and causing maybe one of those chain reactions. It wouldn't be a fully critical mass explosion. But that's why they call it a meltdown. It's literally, you could get too hot and it would just melt. Um, so the way we slow that down is by having these control rods that are made out of an inert material, usually graphite. Um, and though that and graphite basically just gets put in between these other cylinders to stop those stray neutrons from being absorbed by one of the other uranium nuclei. So their job is basically to get in the way to slow things down. And when you need to generate more energy, you move the control rods out so that there's less in the way between the fuel rods and they can generate more heat faster and you can generate more electricity that way. When you don't have need for as much electricity, you push the control rods further in and that slows things down and you aren't generating as much electricity. So this is one of the big advantages that nuclear has over lots of renewables and even fossil fuels, um, is that most fossil fuel plants and pretty much all renewables are, fossil fuel plants are designed to be operated at a constant amount. You're generating a constant amount of electricity. They're not designed to be able to ramp up and down gener uh, electricity production. And renewables, you're at the, you're at the mercy of the elements, right? The sun's not shining, you don't generate as much solar. If there's no wind, you don't generate as much wind energy, right? Um, you can't even use hydroelectric dams if you're in a drought. So nuclear is really, really useful in the fact that it produces energy at a pretty much constant rate, but you can also slow it down and speed it up within a certain range really, really efficiently and effectively. Um, and then the moderator, the part that's coming in here, warming up and coming out, is what would then flow into a heat exchanger that would pass that energy to the water that would actually come in contact with the turbines. Um, so, like I said, in theory, this is all a very well-contained, really pretty useful system. It's not all that dangerous as long as things go well. It also has the capacity to cause really big disasters when things don't go well. And that's really where um, in humanity's confirmation bias and um, our, it's not really a, it's not a logical fallacy, but it's the way our brains are built to remember the exceptions rather than the standard cases means that we remember Chernobyl, we remember Fukushima, we remember Three Mile Island, even though those were really, really small exceptions. Um, compared to the amount of nuclear reactors that have been running worldwide and have had no issues, um, nuclear is actually way safer than a coal, bar coal burning power plant um, as far as the level of pollution and the amount of ecological damage and health issues for the people that live in the area around it. Um, and so it's, well, let's start talking about other types of energy. So why don't, like, why is it still not, like, what we fully do then? Just because we haven't figured it out fully, or? Because during the 60s, when Three Mile Island and Chernobyl happened, um, nuclear, nuclear was a four-letter word. 
Um, the hippie movement actually did a lot of damage to um, green energy in general because they were against any sort of nuclear power plants being brought online either. And so they were protesting. And since that was the new technology, it was easier to demonize that. And the fossil fuel companies, but great, protest nuclear all you want because we're, we're making money hand over fist operating these fossil fuel plants. Um, so it really was more, it's really more cultural than it is anything to do with any real safety issues. Um, by this point, and, and the other aspect is that these power plants, one, they take a long time to build because you have to go through inspection after inspection after inspection, and you have to buy the fuel, which is a highly regulated process. Um, you don't actually earn money back on the money you spend on these until they've been operating for about 10 years. Um, and so since there was a moratorium put in place by policymakers who don't really understand nuclear for so long, we've now reached the point where all the power companies and all the local utility districts are like, well, do we really want to build nuclear or should we just build a bunch of solar because that's what the hot topic is right now um, and just skip nuclear. And so we're kind of at a point right now where it's like, well, we're probably going to need you know, other things have to happen for, before it to be worthwhile to build a nuclear power plant at this point. It's a bigger deal to get all the fossil fuel plants shut down first, and then we can worry about building more nuclear power plants um, down the road. But it's it's one of the things I want to talk about is when you have these, uh, if we have a mixture of different energy sources, they all have their own strengths and weaknesses. Nuclear's got its own strengths and weaknesses. So does wind, so does solar, so does hydroelectric. Um, and you really are going to want a mixture of all of those green energy sources to replace fossil fuels because fossil fuels are just so easy and so, have so much energy in those fossil fuels that we're not going to be able to be able to replace fossil fuels with any one power source. In the future, all of the, these grids, the smart grids is the term that's used, are going to be a mixture of everything um, that we have available based on conditions, based on location, based on demand. Um, it's But there will probably be need for nuclear power plants around major metropolitan areas or in areas like the Northeast, where you've got a whole bunch of cities in a really close proximity to each other. Nuclear is a perfect thing there. They don't have active geological um, issues back east, right? It's probably not going to make sense to do it in California, at least not until the fusion gets figured out because we have more geological issues and our population is a lot more dispersed. So some, a lot of smaller renewable power plants make sense for us. Um, but in certain areas, certain parts of the world, nuclear is almost certainly going to be a big deal for a long time. Um, this is a, just an interesting graph that looks at the share of uh, electricity generated in the U.S. Um, over over the course of the last seven years. Um, where so green obviously is renewables. And you notice green has actually been around since all the way back back um, all the way back in the fifties. We already had green energy being generated. Anybody want to guess what type that would be? Hydro. Really early on, we figured out that water flowing downhill spins turbines really well, right? We've been doing that with windmills since, or with uh, water wheels since the Middle Ages. You know, we just switched it from grinding grain using water wheels to spinning turbines to generate electricity. Um, and it really, renewables in general didn't really start picking up until about 2010 as far as its market share, didn't really start growing until about 2010, when you start seeing a lot more wind farms, a lot more solar farms start uh, showing up. Um, but if you notice, nuclear is still a really huge chunk of the grid here. You know, all, the uh, coal, natural gas, obviously that's fossil fuel. Petroleum does get used to generate small amounts, but that's all still fossil fuel, right? That petroleum should be in here as well. Um, Right coal, uh... coal still, it's gone way down, but it's most, of, most of that has been made up with natural gas, which is also fossil fuel, also lines of being 
being produced through non-sustainable practices and causing lots of, of environmental issues. All our power comes from natural gas here. Yeah, all our all of our power comes from natural gas. Um, and it, it is better than coal burning fire power plants as far as our immediate health, people that live in the area. Um, it's just as bad though in terms of CO2 production emissions when it comes to global warming um, and climate change. So trying to get off of that when it's still well more than half of our total energy production, that's the big, the biggest goal. And most important thing is, is not to get bogged down in what type of renewable energy is the most important or the best or the most green. It's get rid of the worst ones first. And that's the fossil fuel stuff. Might be a stupid question. Does propane fall under natural gas or petroleum? Um, that's that is a good question. Probably natural gas. I I don't see the whole point in separating them out necessarily. Um, it might be considered petroleum just because the gas pipelines probably can, they operate at such a high pressure that I think you would liquefy the propane. Um, so I could make an argument either way. I just have to look it up though. Um, this is the one, this is wild though. There's 8,000 power plants in the US, less than 100 are nuclear, but that's 18% of our total electricity is coming from 1% of the power plants. They are that much more efficient and that much better at generating electricity than pretty much anything else, hands down. Yeah, another uh, thing about the propane, like thorium reactors now, it's been about one percent less, have less waste. Are there any actually in use right now? Are those still experimental? That's a good question. I don't. So the the other term that gets used is they call them breeder reactors. So basically, if uranium is an alpha emitter, and that's the primary fuel source for what they call first generation power plants. Um, thorium reactors, thorium when it breaks down doesn't release quite as much energy as uranium does. Um, but you can take the waste, the spent fuel rods from the uranium power plant and reprocess the, all, all of them. And now they don't have enough uranium in them, but now they have thorium instead. So then you can take the uranium power, the waste from the uranium power plants and turn it into the fuel rods for a thorium power plant. Um, and so they, they also call those second generation power plants because you're using the same fuel twice, basically. So I don't know that they actually generate less waste themselves as much as they are taking the waste from existing power plants and making use of them. So it's more like recycling um, than it is generating new fuel rods. You're just like taking the decay. Exactly. You're taking the radioactive waste from one power plant and turning it into the fuel for the next power plant. And in theory, you could keep going down the line with that um, until you get to one, one decay that's too slow or something like that to actually matter. You have to change the engineering a little bit on those because the thorium decays at a different rate and produces a different amount of heat. So you change the specifics, but it's the same general design as what we just talked about. Um, I don't know if there are any that are commercially working at this point. Um, I know that there are some experimental ones that have been shown to be just, just as efficient or just as effective at generating electricity. Not on the same scale. Just not on the same scale yet. But again, nobody's building new commercial power plants. The reason that the nuclear, the nuclear wedge here has been the same basically since 2000, um, and because right around just before 2000 was about the last time the new nuclear power plant came um, into operation in the commercial grid in the U.S. And since then, it's been the same power plants operating, generating all that electricity that whole time. Um, so that makes me, that answers the question there. There, the idea for a greater reactor has been around longer than that, but it hasn't really been viable for since um, after 2000. So pretty much guarantee that there's none commercially producing electricity. Um, and this does ignore the military grade. The military has lots of nuclear um, power plants. You know, you have a number for how many nuclear boats there are. Mm -hmm. 25 subs, 14 carriers, I think 55 attacks over like 90. Yeah, so the, more than more than double the number of nuclear plants we have commercially producing electricity. 
Um, and, and each one of those, they all have different scales, but you know, an aircraft carrier is roughly the size of a small city. And so they each carry their own power plant with them. The old way of doing before we had nuclear um, nuclear naval vessels was literally they would just fill up on diesel. They just ran on diesel engines back in World War II and post World War II until nuclear power plants started taking off. Um, but now they can you they literally can. That's one of the things that they do when they go into areas that that for uh, disaster relief is they can hook into the local grid and actually use the power plant on an aircraft carrier to power an entire city basically. Um, because they're generating so much energy. And your job was to like deal with the rods, right? Yeah, I was a reactor. Homer Simpson. You're the smart guy, Yeah, I mean, Homer Simpson gets a bad rap. He's, he's got it all figured out. You know, he's, he's a punchline, but he's one income, able to provide for his family, has a house, has a car. You know, can drink beer. Drink beer. Doesn't have to do too much at work. He does so little at work that the little little bird, um, the Bob that says, "You guys remember that one?" Yes. He uh, he replaces his own work. He does gets to work from home, and he replaces his job with the, one of those little birds who dips his nose in water. Homer <laughs> Simpson had to figure it out. Oh, well, basically, my job ninety percent of it was just playing on the switch and looking up every few minutes, making sure yeah. nothing melting down. Yeah, was yeah. flung over. <laughs> Um, this this graph really just makes the point that I was trying that I was uh, bringing up earlier that the amount of energy that you produce from each of these different sources um, this is called the capacity factor. So 100% capacity means it's operating as high capacity as it can at all times, um, and but the demand fluctuates, and so you can actually look at nuclear and see how it fluctuates. That's all on purpose. It's operating near full capacity, but not at full capacity. And when everybody goes to bed or when everybody's at work, they shut it down a little bit. So, because you don't need to generate that much. You compare that to geothermal, you're generating a pretty constant amount of electricity, which actually isn't ideal because unused electricity is actually harmful to the grid. Um, you don't have a way of storing this excess energy. So if you wind up with Demand going down, you can't just shut down the geothermal energy because it's based on volcanoes, right? We can't just like switch off the volcano when we don't need it. Um, and same is true with a lot of these. Um, you can kind of see coal and natural gas kind of mirror the same, the same general shapes where they go up and down as people go to work and go to sleep and things like that. Um, these are monthly. These are these are monthly. Are they monthly? Yeah, they are monthly. Um, but part of that's also going to be, it, it is all tied to the demand. I'm trying to think what the monthly fluctuation is going to be. Well, look at no, it six, to, six months. So this is down into the summer. It goes, it goes up in the summer in some places and down in the summer in other places. Right. So wherever they were measured, this is, this is for the entire U S and so it peaks in July when you, whenever it turns on their air conditioners and then it goes down in the winter when everybody burns crude oil or uh, natural like gas to stay warm. Spring and fall, that's when it's going down. Spring and fall, so nobody's using, they're not using electrical heaters and they're not using their ACs yet. But that's all tied into demand though, right? Okay. Well, like, uh, and, and it looks very similar if you look at it on day to day. I just didn't, I thought it was, I didn't realize it was January, July. I thought it was January, 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 January. <laughs> so I thought it was going to be fall. I don't know, it's that place too. Um, what were you saying, Sydney? Well, like geothermal, like it just depends on where you live. Like we can't do geothermal, Iceland, like Iceland or right. something. Might like that's all they really. So yeah, Nor Norway is almost entirely renewable energy because they have the right geography to build hydroelectric dams, and they also have enough rainfall, and they also have geothermal. Um, we don't have all of that. We don't in California. We might have the. In order for hydroelectric to work, you need a big drop in. Um, in elevation, right? To be able to capture that energy as the water flows downhill. We have that, but we don't have all the water. Um, <laughs> and then we have the, the other issue with that is that you wind up totally destroying the local ecology. We have lots of fish that swim upstream, right? Um, and hydroelectric dams throw all that off. 
So there are limits to how much hydroelectric you want to do. And, you know, like I said, the Norway built all their hydroelectric dams probably back before they were as worried about the ecology as we are now. Um, but I guarantee you that they're, they caused the huge issues that they might, might not have even realized at the time. Um, also, the problem with comparing everything in Norway is Norway is the size of the big city. Their right. population. Their population is not that much, it's a couple million. I think it's like six or seven million. Okay, yeah, so, you know, it's New York City. Probably the population of New York City or LA. Um, this one, so we're not going to get into, we'll talk about, uh, I'm not going to try and speed run through the, the radiation and how it affects biology. We'll, that won't be on the test, but we'll talk about it when we come after the test, just because I know there are people that will be interested in the, the biology aspect of this as well. Um, we'll just keep talking about electricity for a minute and then fusion. So this was actually, this is an older graph from 2018. When I updated these, I thought it might be interesting to see the difference between 2018 and 2024. Biggest difference is, well, other than the fact that they switched other to be a different color for some reason. Um, they switched them to different colors. They're all close to the same, but not quite the same. Um, look at all the, the wind ones that pop up in the Midwest or in the Great Plains. Those weren't there six years ago. But most of the hydroelectric stuff, most of the nuclear stuff, that's been around long enough. It's that it didn't really change over the course of the last, last few years. Um, but look at how many huge coal power plants are still operating through the Rust Belt. Um, and then, and even in the mountains here. But the biggest ones, while there is the giant, giant hydroelectric dam in Washington, um, but we see lots, you can track actually some of the topography by looking at where they build hydroelectric dams, right? They're always on the downhill slope of something that gets a fair bit of rain, at least a little bit of rain. You notice there's hardly any down here in Southern California, right? Because Southern California gets all zero rain, technically. Yeah, electric dam down in central Southern California. Really? Yeah, at the Edison. Oh, that's one that's just north of the uh, LA. Area. It's Kern, yeah, the Kern. Yeah. Um, we toured it when I was a kid in school. But even following, and sometimes you can just track population density too, but definitely interesting to see the difference in the renewables between the two years. And then actually look at all the solar in the East Coast. Solar? So look at all the solar, solar is the yellow, right? They're all tiny because solar doesn't scale as well as hydroelectric or wind. Um, but there's a ton of them and there are a few, less natural gas power plants, not very many less, but, um, and there's actually the slide on breeder reactors. Last but not least, with my last 30 seconds, fusion is super cool, um, but it has its own set of challenges. If we got fusion to work, all the rest of this is out the window. In fact, water scarcity goes out the window too, for that matter, because with, with as cheap as fusion would make electricity, we can just build desalinization plants, as many as we need, wherever we need them globally. Fusion would be that big of a game changer because it's super easy to make the fuel. It doesn't make anything hazardous as waste. It doesn't produce any, any um, fossil fuel emissions, um, greenhouse gas emissions. The problem is, is that you can only do it at really, really high temperatures, like above the melting point of steel. So what they looked at doing is making what's called a tokamak um, reactor, which is basically you make a, a uh, you contain it using magnetic fields, so it doesn't actually come into contact with anything. And so you basically create this superheated plasma using electromagnets in this toroid shape, um, in this torus shape, and then use that, to, again, do the same thing, heat up water to spin a turbine. Um, but it generates so much heat, it really is like a self-contained sun. Um, that, and just recently have they started publishing um, where they're able to get more energy out than they put in. So we've been able to cause, cause fusion reactions for a long time, but not in a way that we could keep them going and not in a way that 
that it was a net positive for the amount of energy released. We just got to that point that uses lasers and it doesn't scale to the industrial scale yet. But we're close. We've gone from the joke was from the 1950s forward is that from the 1950s through through 2010, the joke was fusion is 20 years away. Um, and it has been since 1950. Um, but about 2010, that switch to fusion is five years away and has been for the last 14 years. Um, so we're making progress. We're just not quite there yet, but probably, I'm fingers crossed, within my lifetime, um, at least we should be able to see, see some return on that. That will change everything. It'll be really interesting. We'll have to see what happens. All right. So as far as what's on the test for this, it might show up. Some of that stuff might show up in the definitions. I might ask you to explain um, you know, how a nuclear chain reaction works, why it's caught, you know, keeps itself going, how a nuclear power plant works a little bit, something like that. But in general, most of this won't be on the test. The test is coming Tuesday? Test is this coming Tuesday or this coming Thursday. You're allowed to pick and choose, right? So we're not doing any new material next week. Labs are just meeting for review sessions. And take take the test either Tuesday or Thursday. Do you say something about a Monday review? So for the other lab section um, on Mondays, you're welcome to attend if you have the time available from 10 30 to 12 30. So does every does every chain reaction have a critical mass then? Every 